So hello and welcome to the 2023 Southeast Collaborative Online Conference. My name is Lauren Classy and I'll be your host for this session entitled No More Summertime Blues, Shaking Up Summer Reading Program to Make It Work for You. This event is supported through funding from the Library Services and Technology Act through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Please feel free to ask questions or to make comments in the chat to interact with other attendees and with the speaker within the Whova app for this presentation. And now I am going to pass it over to our speaker, Chelsea Price. Thank you so much for being with us. Hello, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, so I hope everybody is doing well. Um, again, my name is Chelsea Price and I am the library director um, at the Missouri, Missouri Public Library in Missouri, Iowa. Um, I've been the director there for eight years this year, which is just wild to think about. Um, but, and I just, I do want to start off by saying I do not claim to be an expert of any sort and I do not have a library science degree. Um, I actually have a degree in psychology, which believe it or not does help me every once in a while in this job. Um, but I guess you could say that librarianship is in my blood. Uh, my mom was also a tiny library director when I was growing up. Um, so I would go there every day after school and I worked there throughout high school, answering phones and shelving books and stuff. And then uh, my grandma, my mom's mom, was a school librarian from ages 40 until she was 80 and retired. Um, so I just feel very comfortable and at home in libraries and this job has just felt like a natural fit to me um, as soon as I started. Um, so this is a very outdated photo of me. I don't look like that anymore, but I had to use it because of my dog. I think more people should have their pets in their, um, their professional photos. Uh, and then that is also a photo of my book. I published that in 2020, um, October 2020 with ALA editions in partnership with the ARSL. And I got to say 2020. Turns out not a great year for publishing a book, uh, primarily about in-person programming when not a lot of us were doing in-person programming, but it is what it is. What are you gonna do? Um, but anyway, I, I will be coming at this session um, from a small rural library perspective because that's all I know. Um, but I'm hoping that the tips and ideas that I share today um, will be applicable to libraries of any size and any budget. Um, and I'm also uh, going to be talking more mostly about youth programming because that is currently the only summer reading program that we do at my library is youth programming. Um, so yeah, but I hope, again, I hope this will apply to libraries of all sizes and, and types. So before we get into the content, I wanna talk just a bit about Missouri. So I grew up here. Um, I grew up about seven minutes away in a neighboring town. Um, but Missouri is a very tiny rural farming town. Um, we're only a mile and a half total miles, and um, we have approximately 220 people in terms of population. So I know small rural libraries can be considered up to 25,000 people in terms of population. So that term small is very relative, but we truly are one of the smallest, tiniest libraries out there. Um, our school, we used to have a school across the street from the library, um, but it closed down, it consolidated um, with another town in the early 80s, which I imagine was quite a hit to the town. Um, now the nearest school we have in our district is actually 25 minutes away, which is rough. Um, so we don't have a school in town. We don't have a gas station. There's no community center of any kind. There's not even a bank anymore that closed a few years ago. Um, all Missouri has is a fire station. We have a post office. There's a church. There's a bar. Of course, there's got to be a bar. And then there's my little library. So my library serves as that hub of the community that most rural libraries do. Um, we're the only source of free Wi-Fi in town. We are the only um, community meeting space and the only really the only source of free entertainment and programs um, within at least 15 miles. So the nearest grocery store, movie theater, any source of entertainment really is at least 15 minutes away. The nearest, what you would call a big city is about an hour and a half away. Um, 
So I am lucky enough to have a two person staff. It's me and a library assistant. I could not function without her. She is so helpful, um, especially when it comes to things like summer reading and those larger scale programs. Um, those, if I have any solo librarians tuning in today, I give you all of the props because I couldn't function without her. Um, we are only open 20 hours a week and we are just that small building. What you see there, that's, that's it. It's just 1 big room. We don't have any separate meeting rooms. We don't have, you know, a separate children's room. Nothing like that. It's just 1 big room. Um, so prior to 2017 was the 1st time that I asked for a budget increase. Um, prior to that, we had not had an increase in our funding since the year 2000. 17 years we had not had any financial increase. Um, and so I've asked for an increase probably three times since then. But now, to be perfectly open and honest, our annual budget is about $30,000 a year. Um, and I had to fight for that. So that does include all materials. That includes employee pay, which... We don't get paid enough. I realized most librarians don't um, and I had to fight for that. So, as you can imagine, when it comes to programming, I really have to think outside of the box and get creative. To try and pinch those pennies, you know, we shouldn't have to do more with less as libraries, but sometimes we're forced to and that's kind of where we're at right now here. Um, you know, we can't um, afford to hire those pricey performers um, every week during summer reading. So, um. I'm going to be sharing some of the money saving tips that I use, as well as some of the lower budget program ideas that have worked out for us. Um, and yeah, let's get into it. So why have a summer reading program? You know, summer reading, I don't know about you guys. I find it incredibly stressful. Um, sometimes it seems like we're either constantly either getting ready for summer reading or Mm, recovering from summer reading, you know, um, a lot of us tend to blow the majority of our programming budget on summer 1 season of the year, and it's almost our entire program budget. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's easy to question if all that stress is really worth it at the end of the day, but. Well, some librarians um, I know have viewed the traditional summer reading program as kind of that sacred cow that needs to be slayed. Um, and while I wouldn't go that far, there are definite things about it that I take issue with, but um, it's, it's definitely true that there are a lot of benefits to summer programming in some form. So let's get into those benefits. You all know about the summer slide. Um, kids who aren't reading or learning on a regular basis throughout the summer are at a big disadvantage when they return to school in the fall. And so our summer reading programs really fights hard to prevent that summer learning loss that they can experience. Um, this photo is one of our read with the cats days. Um, during the summer last year, and this is just like you've heard about the read to Rover kind of programs where they read to therapy dogs. Well, this my library assistant has a very kid friendly cat that she brings in every once in a while and the kids settle down and read to this cat who absolutely loves it and the kids love it. Um, so it's a win win for everybody and it doesn't cost us a darn thing. So that's something that. Um, we really try to do every summer is some kind of read with the animals um, thing. It gets kids excited about the library. I think that summer reading is a really great gateway into the library. Um, whether there are new visitors to your library, whether it's new families that have just moved to town. Um, these are people who not only may never have set foot in your library before, but might not be aware that you offer programming like this regularly throughout the year, not just in the summer. So this is a great um, way to get them excited and get them to become regular users of your library rather than just summertime users. Um, a lot of people don't even realize what awesome programs that we offer for free. Um, this photo, I love that girl's face in that photo. She's so excited. This is from a messy art program we did one summer, um, and they are making different kinds of slime. And we just did it out on the sidewalk, and then I hosed the, the concrete down after. 
afterwards. It's like experience after a very nasty slime in carpet trauma. Um, so do it outside. But slime is great because all, all ages love it. I love slime. You know, who doesn't love playing with slime? And it's super cheap because the ingredients most of the time are things that can be found in your own home or that you might even already have at the library. And honestly, you can just throw the ingredients down. The kids know what to do. I don't know where exactly they learned it probably TikTok, but um, they just know how to make all different kinds of slime and they love it. Summer reading helps stimulate the desire to read. So the way I look at it, if I can turn even one non-reader into a reader during my summer reading program, then I have done my job. I feel good about it, just that one kid. Um, Cause my job is not to force the kids to read or bribe the kids to read. We'll get into that later. Um, but just to, sh you know, lead them to the books that they might end up loving, you know, put books in hands. That's our job. Um, this photo is, I have a bathtub, an antique um, clawfoot bathtub in my children's space um, that I filled with pillows and blankets. Um, I had one in my first grade classroom. We had a reading tub that we would all fight to read over during free reading time. And um, I just had to steal that idea from my first grade teacher. So the kids really love it. Um, and I just couldn't pass this photo. This is three siblings reading together in the bathtub. And I, it was so picture perfect, I had to use it. Uh, real quick, funny story about the bathtub. I mean, you don't usually see a bathtub in a library, right? So there was a toddler that came in with her mom and she walked over to the bathtub and started taking her shirt off. It was so cute. She thought it was time, time for a bath in the library. It was so, so cute. Um, summer reading provides opportunities for free family fun. So this is a big one, especially in rural communities like mine, low income areas. Also, Missouri is a fairly low income town. Um, I think the programs that we offer in areas like mine are just as important. Honestly, maybe even a little more so given our circulation numbers since 2020, um, maybe even more, more important than the materials we provide to the community is the programs, the entertainment that we offer. Um, and we all know summer reading is a family fun extravaganza that's almost always free for patrons to attend. Um, this is a kids concert that I had actually in partnership with a neighboring library, the town that I live in um, about seven minutes away. Um, they have space. And the Missouri Library does not have space for a concert. So we decided to split the costs, bring our towns together, excuse me, and have this fun family concert. Um, and it was a win-win for everybody. So remember, when you're thinking about partnership opportunities, don't count other libraries out. I think sometimes we get caught up in kind of viewing other libraries as your competition. They take patrons away from you, um, but it, it's, it's so easy to to partner up with other libraries. Um, so keep that in mind for sure. Um, and then the middle photo is we have here in Iowa, um, Iowa is very high for puppy mills. We got a lot of puppy mills, unfortunately. So there is a puppy mill rescue um, here and I happen to know the founder and the founder came with her therapy dog and um, taught the kids about puppy mills. Now puppy mills are horrible, awful things, but she did it in a very kid-friendly way. Um, and she brought coloring sheets and suckers. And then of course her dog was was the main excitement for the kids. She taught, she showed them how she knows how all these commands, all these tricks, um, and the kids did them along with her. It was a lot of fun. And um, Summer reading, finally, it increases interest in the library. Summer reading serves as great PR for the library. Um, a lot of times it makes for good newspaper articles. It makes for great social media posts. It great, makes um, great photo opportunities. Um, it really helps to boost the library's presence in the community. Even non-library users who don't know the rest of the year that anything's happening at the library, chances are that they've heard about the summer reading program just because it's all over. Um, and this photo here is from our annual summer carnival. So we've done this 
every summer except 2020 and 2021, the dark period of the world. And um, we have been doing it since 2017. And we have inflatables, we have face painting, there's a petting zoo and games and prizes and all kinds of cool stuff. And it makes for the best photos that people love to share on Facebook, stuff like that. Our goal, a lot of times I think during summer reading is um, I want people to say, oh my gosh, I didn't know you could do that at the library. Isn't that cool? Um, so in that way, um, it really boosts the library's presence in the community, which is a great thing. Two other of our summer reading um, events that got a lot of attention this past summer, we had a camping theme. Um, I know we all probably don't use the same summer reading theme, but we did a camping theme and um, we had an owl themed day and I had a lady from a local raptor rescue bring in a screech owl, which I didn't know they're only like this big. It was so cute. Um, and the kids, of course, love the owl. Anything with live animals is always a hit. And then after that, we dissected owl pellets, which sounds disgusting. And it is a little disgusting, to be honest with you. But so owl pellets are basically... They're little balls that owls vomit up. If you don't, I don't know how many of you will know, but they they gag them up and spit them out. And it's basically the undigestible parts of the animals that owls eat. So there's little bones in there. There's little pieces of hair and fur. And the kids, they were freeze dried. So they weren't gross texture or smell or anything funky like that. But um, the kids dissected them and tried to identify like what animal the bones came from, what um oh my gosh it was just great they loved it so much kids kind of love anything a little yucky or creepy and the kids absolutely love this and then speaking of yucky um we did a bug hunting program that is the photo on the right um i had a woman from a local nature center come and she had all these little nets and little jars and we have a park right across the street from the library where the school used to be aptly called schoolhouse park and um, the kids just ran free in the park looking for bugs and then we brought brought them back together in a circle and we went through and identified what bugs everybody caught the kid i've never seen kids go so crazy over bugs it was wild um, and then, of course, she made sure and say, now go take these bugs back to exactly where you got them and let them go because we don't keep the bugs. We put them back where they're safe. Um, and the kids just loved it. Um, and I remember I was talking about a bug hunting program at a conference last year. And I had, speaking of bugs, one woman said that for their camping themed uh, summer reading, they were going to do bug eating like cooking with bugs and crickets and cricket flour and i was like that's a little a little much for me but i give her props for thinking of such a creative out of the box idea so anyway those are just a few of the the wonderful things that summer reading in some form does um, for our community and for our young patrons um so take a good thing, summer reading is a good thing, but I think it can be made better. Um, I think change can be a very scary word for a lot of us, um, but I don't think that libraries should fear change. I think that libraries should fear staying the same and not evolving our programming um, to keep up with the interests of the community, um, what's going on in the world, um, maybe, your numbers have dipped. Honestly, all of our numbers have dipped again since 2020. But if you feel that your numbers are consistently low for summer reading, maybe your staff is getting burnt out from the stress of summer reading, um, or maybe you're just tired of your current summer reading program or how you do things, um, then maybe it's time for something different. So I'm going to share with you a few different ways that you can shake up your summer reading programs. Simplify, simplify, simplify. So it is ironic that I'm talking about simplifying and this is the busiest visually slide I've ever seen in my life. Um, but you know, it is what it is. So first assess your goals. 
um, pinpoint what's important and focus on that throughout the summer. So what do you, what do you intend to achieve? What do you want to do with your summer reading program? Do you want to get as many books in hands as you can? Do you want to focus more on outreach, getting out into the community to reach non users of the library? Do you want to focus primarily on youth programming? Do you want to, um, you know, it just, it varies from library to library, um, but I think it's important to pinpoint those goals and then just keep, keep working on that throughout, throughout the summer. Rebrand if it's necessary. So summer reading program, the word summer reading, that is very appealing to kids who already love reading and love books and love libraries, but it can be kind of intimidating and sometimes even discourage those who aren't readers yet. Um, I have found that just the word reading can evoke some negative feelings for our younger patrons. I'll never forget, I had a fourth or fifth grade boy in the library one day in the spring. And I said, oh, are you gonna be coming to summer reading this summer? And I just meant like attending the fun events, coming to the carnival, what have you. Um, and his face, I will never, he's like, no, I'm not summer reading. I don't want, I don't like to read. I'm not gonna read. And this poor kid, truly thought I was going to sit him in a chair, put a book in his hands and force him to read. He thought that's what summer reading was and he didn't, he wasn't interested. And so starting then I've always referred to it just as our summer program. That's all. Um, I've seen a lot of um, libraries call it the summer fun program, summer adventure club, summer learning. Um, but if that's something um, that you feel like um, could could change attendance, could it could um, encourage interest, then consider rebranding. I did, and I think it did boost attendance for me. Um, keep it simple. We summer reading is a lot, or it can be a lot, and and sometimes I think we don't realize it doesn't have to be. Summer reading is what we make it, and we don't have to do all the things. Um, so don't hesitate to cut things out if they aren't working for your library. You can change them or eliminate them entirely. There's no rule book saying that we have to have kids track their minutes read. There's no rule that says we have to be giving out labeled prizes for this amount of minutes and this amount of minutes and this amount of minutes. Um, there's nothing that says you have to have a baby summer reading, a youth summer reading, adult, teen summer reading. Um, we don't have to have a kickoff party and a wrap up party and you know programs every day. We don't have to have a craft and a snack at every youth program. Um, it can be as crazy intense or as low maintenance and low stress as you want it to be. Um, so if you feel overwhelmed, cut back on the more costly energy intensive programs and lean more into passive programming, lean more into drop in programs um, that don't require as much staff time and energy. And then finally to theme or not to theme. Again, you don't have to go with a theme. Um, I know a lot of us do CSLP theme. Um, Iowa recently just started doing the I read theme. Um, but there's no saying there, you don't have to have any theme at all. You can do something totally different. You can come up with your own theme or something we did with this flyer here. Um, I think this was two summers ago and the I read theme was color your world, I think. And then the CSLP theme was tales and tales with animals. And we really liked both themes. So we decided to squish them together and uh, call it colorful tales and tales. So we focused on not only animals, but we also did some messy, colorful art projects in there instead. Um, and it was the best of both worlds and the kids loved it. And I think when your theme is different, um, parents might appreciate that your, your programs are so much different than a neighboring library. So that way they can do both and get completely different prizes, completely different performers, events, etc. Um, this year we are doing our own theme. We've never just totally made up our own theme. Um, and I think both CSLP and iReads themes are great this year, but I, we just weren't super excited about the marketing materials and things like that. Um, and so we are doing blast from the past. 
Um, and each week will be a different decade that we're focusing on. So we're going to make tie dye stuff for the 70s and we're going to make hacky sacks for um, the 90s and make your own beanie babies for the 90s as well. We're, we're really excited. Um, so again, there's there's nothing that says you have to stick with a theme. So tracking minutes, a necessary evil. Um, so tracking minutes can be kind of controversial in the library world um, because we don't want reading. We don't want kids to feel that reading is a chore or a homework assignment. Um, my opinion is that it shouldn't matter how much they're reading, how many books they're reading, how many minutes they're reading. It shouldn't matter, but just that they are reading at all. That's what matters. Um, plus, the tracking minutes can be a hassle for not only staff, but parents too, trying to, you know, say to their kid, okay, you have to do 15 minutes every day and then keeping track of that little slip of paper. Um, and sometimes there are issues, you know, there are issues with dishonesty, not only from the kids surprisingly, but from the parents can lie sometimes as well. Um, so a lot of libraries because of this have changed the way that they track uh, minutes. Some excuse me, have stopped doing it entirely. They don't track minutes at all. Um, some libraries do bingo sheets. My library started doing bingo sheets um, like three years ago, and I will never go back, never, ever. I love the bingo sheets so much. This is an example of one of them. Um, and I love them because they're not only reading focused goals. There are reading goals on there. You can see, read a book outside, um, read a book out loud to someone, but there's other things on there as well. Do something nice for another person, um, play outside, visit an educational website. So there's all kinds of things on there. So even if the person visiting your library doesn't necessarily love reading or finds reading intimidating, that's okay. They can still participate and do some of the other goals too. Um, so we love our bingo sheets. Um, other libraries I've seen have done a community reading goal. They set a goal for their whole town. And if the town as a whole reaches that goal, then the library throws some sort of party or event in celebration that they reach the goal. Um, I've seen a lot of patrons versus librarians. Can you read more than we do? Um, which in our case, they would easily beat us because there's only two of us, but you know, and then there's a lot of awesome reading log alternatives out there. So um, we don't really have a reading log besides we just do the bingo sheets, but I've seen calendars, I've seen passports, I've seen maps. Like this is from um, a nearby library in my area. And this was for the Color Your World theme. And I love this because it gets kids to read outside their culture. Um, so the goal was to read a book set on each continent or written by an author um, from that continent. Um, and then once they read a book from that area, they could color the continent in and turn it in for a prize when it was full. And I thought that was an awesome idea because not only does it serve the purpose of getting the kids to diversify what they're reading, um, it's also a great idea for a reading log. I also have seen um, there's this really great library blog. It's called Hafuboti. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but it's spelled H-A-F-U-B-O-T-I, and it's wonderful. Um, she does a coupon booklet, and she just gives it out at the beginning of the summer, and that is the reading log and the prizes that the kids will use throughout the entire summer program. Um, so her prizes are built right in. There's gift certificates to local restaurants, passes to I don't know, like roller skating rink or nonprofits. Um, so her prizes and and reading logs are all built right in. And I think that is a wonderful idea that is lower stress for staff. Prizes. So you you can probably tell from the title of this slide my thoughts on prizes for summer reading. I've had enough of oriental trading trinkets. Um, 
I'm tired of kids tearing through their reading goals for the summer just to get a free t-shirt or something. And then they're like, oh, I am i don't have to read anymore for the rest of the summer because I got my t-shirt and I am done. I just, I feel like offering prizes in exchange for reading makes it seem like reading is a chore that needs to be rewarded when in a perfect world right reading for kids would be the reward in itself we want kids to want to read um so you may ask do i still offer prizes and the answer is yes yes i do but i feel a little bit icky about it i don't love it but i do however i no longer get the cheap plastic toys from for example for from oriental trading that always break and always end up in the trash. I don't do t-shirts anymore. What I do, I try to do experience prizes. I try to do books and I do have a few small things, things like candy. Um, the kids really like these scratch and sniff bookmarks I get from Demco and color changing pencils from Demco are always a hit. Um, so I do still do some prizes, um, but um, because the, the kids motivation to read should be more intrinsic than extrinsic. Um, meaning their motivation should come from within rather than being rewarded for reading. Um, because that's more effective in the long run and that will keep kids reading more in the long run. Reading for pleasure just is not everyone's cup of tea and that's okay. I know that sounds a little counterintuitive as a librarian, but. Um, it's just not everyone's cup of tea and that's fine. A couple of free toys is not going to change that. Um, will forcing kids to read in order to get a prize and make them like it? I, I am not so sure. Like I hate running. I hate running. I'm going to try this metaphor here. I'm not sure if it'll work, but we're going to try it. I hate running. If someone said to me, you're going to run this many minutes every day for a month and then at the end of the month you're gonna get a free pizza hut personal pan pizza would i still run i would because i would want that pizza but that doesn't i wouldn't like running more at the end of the day i'd like you a little less for making me run but do you get where i'm coming from do you get i don't know if this metaphor makes sense but you get it i think um so because of this a lot of, of libraries have changed the way they do their prizes. I have seen so many awesome science activity packs ideas that libraries give away for prizes in summer reading. So in the upper right corner, you can see one. This is a static electricity butterfly project. Um, so I think this is great because it's cheap. Um, it's easy. You just shove all this stuff in the baggies. And essentially, the kids are making their own prizes and they're learning without even realizing it. So I think that's wonderful. Um, experience prizes. So this is things like, um, if you win this prize, you get to have a pizza party at the library or a private movie night with friends at the library, or um, maybe the fire department can let you have a ride in their fire truck, or you can pie the librarian in the face. Um, these are also things where you can like add to a community art project. Like if you read so many minutes, you can add um, your sticky note to the sticky note art mural that we're doing as a library, or you can add this Lego to the Lego sculpture we're building as a library. Um, so these are all great ideas for prizes that aren't things. Um, bragging rights. So these prizes, for example, um, the, the family could get a sign in the, their yard saying something like a star reader lives here or a personalized book plate in the child's favorite book saying um, so and so is an awesome reader and recommends this book or something. Or um, if your library is large enough to have a loudspeaker, you can announce their first name and and I don't know, something nice about them um, over the loudspeaker to celebrate. Um, and these are all things that um, are pretty low cost, low energy, um, and aren't stuff for the kid to haul home. That'll still make them feel special. Um, and then of course, literary prizes, books, whether weeded books or donated books. Um, these are things like crossword puzzles, magazine subscriptions, pens and pencils, 
notebooks, things like that. These are things that we use pretty frequently in our library um, for prizes. And then of course, coupons and passes to local businesses. We already talked about this a bit um, in the previous slide. Um, but this is a great way to not only get rid of the junky prizes, but also lift up other local businesses, possibly opening the door for future partnerships with your library. Um, the top left photo I want to share is the prize wheel that we use mostly for outreach events. So if I go to like a school fair or a farmer's market, I bring the prize wheel with me because it gets the kids attention. Honestly, spinning the wheel is kind of the prize in itself. Um, but my, my brother built this for me, by the way. So if you have any handy family members, um, it's really great. And it has things on there. It does have the things like the bookmarks and the pencils, but there's also like passes to a local roller rink. There is um, help the librarian plan um, the next youth program, um, which makes kids feel really excited because they're working. Um, and more experienced prizes like that. And there's a book, you can win a book on there as well. Um, so that has worked really well for us. The bottom photo is the claw. The claw that I love and the kids love, but I honestly regret buying a little bit because they love it too much. Um, we just bought this last summer and we only used it for a month and that was enough. So the claw is very noisy. And again, the kids love it, so it makes it worth it. But um, so when they get a bingo on their bingo sheet that I shared earlier, they get to come in and do the claw. Um, and the claw, there's it comes with little balls. And um, I think, I don't know if I mentioned the price yet, but I think it was only 40 some dollars on Amazon. And um, it comes with little plastic balls that you can put candy inside. We also put stickers in there and um, uh, little mini puppet keychains and little squishies that kids really like. Um, and the kids, man, if spinning the wheel is like a prize to the kids, using the claw machine is the best thing that has ever happened to them. They live and die for that thing. So I do recommend it, but then also I'm sorry. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about marketing. So I think marketing... We do the most marketing, I think, for summer reading. Um, we do the school visits. We do the daycare visits. We do flyers. We do, I don't know, some t sometimes we do letters, things like that. Tons of social media posts. And I think this is because summer reading has to compete with so many things. So not only does it compete with other library summer reading programs, um, it competes with things like summer camp, um, summer vacations, sports. Um, so it can be hard to keep our numbers up. Um, and I find that dropping library card requirements, which I know some libraries do still have, like to participate in the summer reading program, you have to have a library card. We don't do that. We don't even do registration. If you show up and ask for a bingo card, you are part of our summer library program. Um, and requiring signups. I also think that eliminating fines um, can boost your numbers with things, and that doesn't require any staff work at all. Um, I eliminated fines from my library almost as soon as I got the job. I just feel like it's a huge barrier to access, and I don't like that. And in my area, obviously, they still pay the library if they lose an item. Um, but as far as overdue fines, no. Um, I feel... A lot of people, if they were to rack up overdue fines, um, they just would stop coming in. They would not come to the library anymore. Um, and honestly, as a librarian, and I say this with no shame, I, my books are always overdue every single time. So, yeah, I think dropping that is, is a very easy way to possibly boost your numbers to your programs. Um, partner with other libraries to advertise together. If you're a very small library like mine, and there's other very small libraries in your area, why not all go together to the school um, so that you don't have to visit every classroom? You can break up once you're in there and kind of all advertise, hey, here's what's going on at this library and this library and this library. Why don't you come to all of them? Um, again, other libraries 
um, are great partners, and I think we do forget that sometimes. Um, Facebook is most effective for our library. Other social media uh, platforms um, have not been very successful for, for my library. Um, and I have found that Facebook ads for our larger programs can really make a difference. They're quite effective for big programs. So I use Facebook ads for our summer carnival every year and for our larger scale adult programs that usually get pretty low attendance. Excuse me, and I've been really happy. It's a lot of bang for your buck. Um, and I like that you can target it to specific audiences um, but yeah, I've been, we don't use it often, maybe a few times a year, um, but I've been very happy with Facebook ads. Um, the 70-30 rule on social media, I can't remember where I read this, but I feel like I've read it a lot of times. So 70, 30% of your Facebook posts should be actively promoting your library, your library programs, your library services, things like that. But then the, the other 70%, should be either promoting other things going on in your community, not library focused, or they should be engagement posts, things like, um, what are you reading today? Or drop your favorite book here and we'll recommend a read alike for readers advisory. Um, share a picture of your pets, you know, things like that. Um, and do as I say, not as I do, because if you look at my Missouri Library Facebook page, it's, I really need to work on the engagement post because it's all about the library there. Um, but I do think it is important to not just be all about you on Facebook. Um, video content, we've had a lot of success with video content. Um, animals are always popular when you're promoting summer reading. Um, you can do book talks on your new summer reading books. You can do a story time song that's focused on the theme that you're using for summer program. Um, and then um, sometimes some libraries even do fun dances and songs on there to promote summer reading. Um, I remember there's a library we go to pretty often um, and I visited there last spring. And I heard really loudly, Eye of the Tiger playing from another room. And I was like, what is that? And I went and I peeked in the window. There was probably about 10 librarians with their colorful book carts. And they were doing a choreographed routine to Eye of the Tiger to promote their summer reading program. And it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. So stuff like that usually gets a lot of engagement, a lot of attention. And sometimes you can go viral. Um, this um, screenshot here was of a video that I made um, probably closer to when I started working here. Um, and this was not to promote summer reading, but just to promote the library services and what we offer. Um, and I borrowed this T-Rex inflatable costume from a friend and decided to dress up in it and just have my husband film me using the different parts of the library. And people got a big kick out of it. It was a lot of fun to make. Um, and it got a lot of engagement. So just don't take yourself too seriously on social media. I think that's important rule of thumb. Um, kind of hand in hand with that attitude is key. I think especially when we go and do outreach, um, it's important to be enthusiastic about the things you're talking about, um, particularly with kids. And this is something that I had to work on because it was out of my comfort, comfort zone at first. Um, but don't be afraid to make a fool of yourself. If you are excited about something, the kids really pick up on vibes and they'll get excited about it too if they can tell you truly are excited. Um, and also be a constant advocate for your programs and try to find a way to somehow, if you have an upcoming program, find a way to mention it to every single person that walks through your door. So the one I use, because I am not the most organized person and my library is, messy a lot of the time. Uh, my favorite thing to say is, oh, I'm so sorry about the mess. We're just getting ready for this awesome program we're having next week. Let me tell you about it. Um, so not only is that a great way to promote your programs, but it's also a great way to make an excuse for the mess that's in your building. Um, and then some out of the box ideas for advertising. Um, our town lets us, lets us advertise in the water bill. We get to send like a half piece of paper with announcements on it with the water bill that goes out to everybody in the city. 
obviously this probably isn't feasible for larger cities, um, but it's great for small towns. Same thing with a church bulletin. We only have one church in town. Almost everybody goes to it. And so I just email the woman that types them up. I email her our library announcements and she puts them in the church bulletin. And that really reaches a lot of people. Sidewalk signs, we love our sidewalk sign here in this photo. I think I ordered it from Demco. Um, and sometimes for big programs, we wheel it out right in the middle of the street. I don't know if that's legal, but we do it. And again, that would not work in a large city, but it works for small towns. Um, and then chalk, um, sometimes makes a big difference. I think this would work better in larger cities where you could chalk the sidewalks. You see it a lot on college campuses. If there's events coming up, um, students will write it and chalk on the sidewalk and that way they know people will see it. Also having um, advertisements as your computer screensaver or the computer wallpaper. So you can make the kids who are playing Fortnite and Roblox, you can make them look at it and know what programs are coming up because you know that's what they're doing on there is they're playing Roblox and Fortnite. Um, digital picture frames are pretty cheap nowadays on Amazon and you can just upload your, your flyers or your posters to them and it'll scroll through showing everybody what you have coming up. I don't know why this is, but people pay a lot more attention to moving screens than they do to paper flyers. So this can be really effective. And then coasters. I think you can make coasters relatively cheaply on vistaprint.com or a similar website. Um, and if you have a bar or a pub in town that a lot of people gather, see if you can put, put some coasters out there. Oh, and bath. don't forget bathrooms too. Um, if you have bathrooms at your library with stalls, put, put flyers on the back of the door because they gotta, you know, they're gonna be sitting there regardless. So they might as well have something to look at. So those are just some different ways to advertise um, your summer reading program. Some other things to consider. Watch out for it. We've always done it this way. Particularly, I feel like this is a thing in smaller towns where the people have been around for a long time or like their family is, has always been from there. Um, just because something has been done a certain way for so many years, that doesn't mean it's the right way. I think there's a lot of nostalgia linked to libraries because we did the summer reading program as kids and we loved it so much, And and but we have to get out of that. Um, we always have to be evolving to keep up with the community. Otherwise, we can't really fulfill the needs of the community if we never change. I think this thinking we've always done it this way also kind of stifles creativity because Taking a chance on new ideas is so important and it can lead to such bigger, better things. Um, put books in hands, any books. This goes with this graphic here. Let kids read whatever they want, the end. Um, it is not our job to police what kids read. Um, it's the parent's job to, to keep track of what their kid is reading, not ours. So it's not my job to tell that fifth grader checking out a picture book that he should be reading something more appropriate for his age group. No, I'm gonna check the picture book out to him. And I'm not going to tell that kid, I don't know, the middle schooler wanting to check out a Stephen King book that it's not appropriate for him to check out. Um, that's not my job. Um, there was one fifth grader, for probably a fifth grader, who wanted to check out a Stephen King book. And I said, all right, buddy, you got it. And I checked it out and he sat quietly in the corner and read for, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 minutes. And then he brought the book over to me and pointed at a word. And he said, what, what does this word mean? And the word was enema. And friends, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I described it to him in the most child-friendly way I could think of. But you know what? It's not my job to tell kids what they should and shouldn't be reading. So put any books in their hands, audiobooks, comic books, graphic novels, manga, magazines, newspapers, put books in hand. Um, our job is to encourage a love of reading of any kind. Um, finally, oh, not finally, but almost finally. Um, if you are in a position of power where you have staff working under you, be kind to them. I mean, all the time, but especially during summer reading. Um, let them wear tennis shoes and jeans, especially youth librarians. They're on their feet running around with kids all day. Let them wear tennis shoes. Um, 
let them take vacation during summer reading. It's not going to be the end of the world. I promise it'll be okay. Um, just think a lot of parents, they can only take vacation with their kids in the summer. Um, there's a lot of weddings that go on in the summer. Um, again, summer camps and sports. So be open to letting your staff take vacation during the summer. I think a lot of youth librarians in particular have left their department or left the field entirely because of the stress and the pressure of summer reading. And that just isn't right. So go easy on your staff all year round, but especially in the summer. Ask for help. We can't do it us alone. We can't do it by ourselves and, and we don't get any prizes for trying to. So ask for help. Consider putting together a teen advisory board where the teens can help you with the younger kids programs. Um, see if the school principal or superintendent will offer extra credit for students who help volunteer at the library over the summer. Um, don't try and do everything on your own. Um, and regroup. At the end of the summer, ask yourself, ask your staff, ask your patrons, how did it go? Do you have any feedback for me? And then take note of all of those things and keep that info handy for next year. I keep a spreadsheet of all the programs I do throughout the year, not just in the summer. And I like to be able to look back at patterns like, hmm, programs in May usually don't work out. There's just too much going on. I'm gonna cut back on programs in May or programs during a certain night of the week don't typically work. Maybe I shouldn't plan programs for that day anymore. Um, stuff like that, it just can really help you for next year. And then some general money saving tips, always ask for discounts. You, you never know um, what people might be willing to give you or help you with unless you ask. The worst that they can say is no. Um, this is an example with the bathtub um, in my kid's area. Someone was selling it, I think for $50 on a Facebook marketplace. And I told him what I wanted it for and he gave it to me for free. But that time I didn't even have to ask, but just talk about the amazing things that the library does for kids. Um, and people are often willing to, to cut you some slack and give a discount. Uh, search for deals. I've had a lot of luck at garage sales, secondhand stores, especially secondhand kid stores. Like if you have once upon a child in your area, that's great for books and prizes and toys. Um, I use target circle a lot. I enter my Disney movie codes in Disney movie insiders to get cool stuff. Um, use Rakuten and retail me not. Um, you can also take surveys to win things like magazine subscriptions or gift cards that you can use as prizes. Um, I, I have used Survey Junkie and Recycle Bank, I think are just a few. Um, and then use what we've got. I do this often. I'll go back if I'm stumped for a program or a craft, I'll go back in our storage closet and see what we have a lot of. Um, for example, if you have a lot of cardboard in there, maybe you could do, um, you could make a cardboard cat castle to donate to the local humane society for the cats to play in. That would be a really great one for the kindness theme for this summer. Um, include your wish list on your website and your Facebook page. I put together a wish list on Amazon of, um, of picture books. I just said, hey, we need more picture books if you want to donate some see this link and i got probably a dozen i get probably a dozen picture books donated to my library each time i share it um so that's something to consider if you don't have a library wish list on your website and your social media definitely put one together um and then passive programming i think is often forgot about but it's so easy and so cheap and requires so little staff time and energy and the impact is often more than in-person programs. Um, one of the best, actually probably the best book I've ever read on librarianship um, is called, and, and I say that as someone who wrote a book on librarianship, it's better than my book. <laughs> um, it's called The Passive Programming Playbook. Um, and it's amazing. I got so many ideas for passive programs on there. Um, and it makes for great interactions um, with your patrons. It makes for great social media posts. These are just a couple of my favorites that I've used in different variations for various programs. Um, for a sports theme, I did um, the heights of the average heights of different um, athletes 
And then the kids would stand next to them and see if they were as tall as a basketball player. They weren't, they never were as tall as a basketball player, um, but they could compare their heights to these different types of athletes. Um, the other one on the right is back to school, I spy. I just did a bunch of random pictures printed out and then wrote a little poem to see what they could find um, in that photo that was back to school themed. And again, you could do this with so many different themes. We use whiteboard polls a lot. Whiteboard polls are awesome passive programming. And then focus on partnerships. I think partnerships are the bread and butter of, of small librarianship, but it should be the bread and butter for every library's programming because it can save so much money. It can do so much good for not only the library, but whatever business or organization you're partnering with. Um, and it, it, it can lead to some, some really awesome programs. Um, really, really quickly, I'm gonna zoom through this because we are almost out of time. We're gonna talk quickly about burnout um, because summer reading can lend itself so well to burnout. Um, I think it's so important. Um, librarianship is a tough gig in the best of times, um, but particularly in the summer. And I think that libraries like mine um, we're especially susceptible to burnout because all the responsibilities are on one person's shoulders most of the time. Um, you're not just the library director. You are the youth and teen librarian. Um, you do outreach. You do accounting. You do landscaping and janitorial work. Um, you do it all, and it's a lot. And librarians in larger libraries have to wear other hats. Um, they have to deal with homelessness and drug addiction and issues that social workers and our government are meant to deal with. Um, and that's a lot. And, and it's a huge thing. Um, and summer reading can exacerbate all of that. And so you all know the symptoms of burnout. So we've all been there. So I'm not going to go through those. Um, I'm just going to share really quick a few things that have helped me. That is my son, Milo. He's he's basically like an adult now. So he no longer looks like that, which is devastating. But um, so find your people, seek out people who are in the same boat as you, um, start a group with other local librarians of similar size, join listservs, join Facebook groups, um, join our, you know, um, associations that, that are good for libraries of your size. Um, my, my, I do, I co-host with Bree Drapa from Vermont. I co-host a um, solo librarian happy hour. We do it the first, let me think here, the first Thursdays of every month. Um, we, we host it virtually and we just bounce ideas off of each other, commiserate with each other. Um, so feel free to join us that you can get more information on the ARSL um, website. Having just a few other people who know what you're going through and can serve as a sounding board can really make a big difference. Remember that we are librarians, not brain surgeons. Um, we don't have to take work home with us. I know that a lot of us do, um, but it's so important to create those boundaries um, and unplug when we're at home. Libraries are essential. We learned that. We're definitely essential, um, but we're not brain surgeons and no one is going to die if we don't immediately respond to that email. Um, set those boundaries and try to stick to them. Focus on the positive. So I originally included that in my book, but you know what? I wrote my book in 2019 when things were very, very different and I see things a little differently now. So that's why I crossed it out. I don't think you always have to, to focus on the positive. If that's something that helps you is to look at everything with those kind of rose colored glasses um, and look on the bright side, I'm very happy for you. That kind of thing does not work for me. I am not a natural optimist. Um, so, and it's okay to say that sometimes things just suck and, and you don't always have to be positive. Um, but one thing that has helped me is keeping an inspiration folder of positive feedback that I've gotten um, from patrons, from fellow librarians. Um, so that's something I do look back on. That's something positive. And give yourself the gift of doing less. We covered this before, but we don't have to do it all. Um, I There's this mm, concept now in, in our society that we always have to hustle and we always have to be doing something. And if we're not exhausted after a day of work, we're not doing it right. But this is not sustainable and this is not healthy. Um, so I think it's important to learn how to say no and don't be afraid to do it often. Um, don't visit every classroom to promote summer reading, visit one. 
don't try for having programs every day. Try one complete well thought out program a week rather than five hasty thrown together programs. Um, there's sometimes an unspoken expectation of a personal sacrifice in our field that we will do anything for our community. Um, because don't we want, don't we love our community and don't we want to serve them with a smile? Um, and that's not healthy because your mental health truly does come first. And I think we forget that. So just keep that in mind that mental health is self care. Um, and finally, I want to say you're doing amazing, sweetie, my little Chris Jenner gif. Um, I think that whatever you're doing right now for, for your community is more than enough. I thank you so much for, for being here with me, being here, staying here in this field. It's hard. Um, and I give you all, all the props. I think we're forgetting that we have recently gone through this whole collective global trauma and we're still recovering from that both physically and mentally. Um, and it's a lot. So I wanna tell you that your community is so lucky to have you and you're doing a great job. And finally, um, you can always feel free to reach out and contact me. Um, there's my email address or on our library's Facebook page. Um, and I am always happy to hear from you guys or share resources of any kind. But anyway, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for sharing all of that. You shared some really great ideas. Um, and thank you to everyone who is attending the webinar. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to the speaker using her contact information, or you can also reach out using the Whova app. Um, an evaluation is provided with the conference session resources, and we uh, value your feedback about this session and about the conference. So thanks everyone for making the 2023 Southeast Collaborative Conference successful, and we hope to see you all next year.